All right, everybody give it up for Flora. Okay. Uh, thank you for your patience, and thanks for coming. I'm super excited. Uh, I'm Flora. Like everyone said, I live in New Orleans with my family. I came here with my baby last year, so you may have seen, I was the person with a 10-week-old. Uh, I write Elixir at HCA every day. I love it. Um, and we're about to go on a little adventure through the history of programming languages that led to Elixir. Uh, this was inspired by a talk I saw at Strange Loop last year. Uh, I don't, did anyone raise your hand if you didn't see this in person? Uh, it was really great, history of mathematics, and it made me think, it reminded me of Taylor Swift um, in her Eras tour, <laughs> where she goes through the history of all the albums leading to the present, and I thought, man, that'd be a really fun structural device, a rhetorical device to structure a talk around. So here we are. Um, if you haven't, I've, I've never been to the tour. If you have New Orleans tickets, let me know. Um, and if you are a Swifty, you might have a little more fun, and if you're not, it, it's okay. Um, so anyway, first let's talk about coffee. Is my voice okay? Am I holding my mic close enough? All right, cool. So coffee, coffee and concurrency. Um, in 2018, Joe Armstrong, one of the creators of Erlang, gave this talk where he showed this slide to show the difference between concurrency and parallelism. Um, show of hands, who saw that talk in person? I know at least one person in this room did because he introduced it. Two, awesome. Uh, so I really love this uh, diagram. I thought it was really, uh, just easy to understand that concurrency, um, when he, oh, let me start over. When he was in Ericsson, he was sitting waiting for coffee and he, this thought came to him of, oh, this is, how, this is how I explain concurrency. So concurrency is one coffee pot with um, two lines of people trying to get their coffee. Parallelism is two queues, um, two coffee machines. I thought this was really great. Um, and so then the rest of the talk, he says, this is the problem with programming. The world is parallel. Uh, the room is parallel. Right in this room, there's 150 people in the room. We're all parallel entities. We're running, like cars run around the streets. Everything's parallel. But when we program things, we try to think of them predominantly sequentially. Um, I thought that was like just a really cool analogy. Another thing to layer on top of this is a concept from Smalltalk. So who has used Smalltalk? Has anyone written Smalltalk? Got some people. Awesome. Uh, so Smalltalk, you know, is all about message passing. Uh, Alan Kay, this is a quote from him talking about it. Um, you know, so if someone says, I forgot you existed, just send another message. They will find out who you, uh, what's going on with you. Um, so back to concurrency, um, not, not much about Smalltalk. Uh, so in addition to concurrency, uh, Joe talks about the fact that you have to have this message pass passing. Otherwise, these processes would just be, you know, totally isolated. Uh, so these two concepts together reminded me of something in design uh, called pluriversality. Um, so Dr. Leslie Ann Newell, who is a hero of mine, uh, in her recent book, Design Social Change, talks about the fact, I'm just gonna read it. <laughs> in creating and imagining new worlds, we must not forget that as decolonial theorists Mirasol de Candana and Mario Blaster say, we live in a world of many worlds. Universe means the whole world, cosmos, totality of existing things, it's from Latin, means all things, everybody, all people, the whole world. But the pluriverse is about many worlds. It conjures up an image of many worlds turning at the same time. Some of these worlds connect and some won't, but they all exist simultaneously. And that really <laughs> reminded me of programming uh, because there are many different processes isolating separately, uh, talking to each other, as opposed to there being like one universal Borg shared memory. Uh, and it also the history of programming, because a lot of talks will usually show a linear timeline, as in, you know, first came Ada Lovelace and Babbage, and then it kind of keeps moving along like that. And it was interesting because that's kind of ahistorical the more I got into it. There's a lot of different developments happening across space and time. Many times there's a really cool discovery that no one knows about for years later. Um, and so, yeah, anyway, let's talk about Elixir. <laughs> so uh, the story of our community. Uh, who in this room has used Elixir? Fantastic, me too. Uh, so uh, right, why, would, why was Elixir created? What was kind of the motivation? There's a quote from Jose right at the beginning saying, yeah, that absolutely beautiful piece of software, the Erlang VM, I want to use it more, but it's missing some stuff, and I want to add this stuff. Uh, so that's when I started working on Elixir, and I reached out to Frank Hunleth, uh, who's here, uh, about why he wanted to use uh, Nerves 
He says it was because he wanted to get Erling in a form he could actually use for work projects. Uh, Erling required so much time to port, nobody wanted to take the risk, but Elixir and Erling had features that resonated with embedded uh, message passing and fault tolerance and stuff. So uh, that is the wrong um, uh, uh, citation. I'll fix that <laughs> on our slides. Uh, so Elixir, Erling VM, and other stuff. Um, so then what is Erling? So if you're ready for it, this is the one that we all love. Uh, Erling is, uh, okay, for show of hands, who's used Erling, if you've all used Elixir? You have obviously, thank you, written Erling. Uh, so Robert Verding in this uh, 2014 talk talks about the facts of Erling, the language that are most important, which he says are immutable data and pattern matching. So uh, what is a functional, but all functional languages have that. So what's a functional language? Uh, something that you know makes you a little happier, avoid some teardrops on your keyboard. So let's start with SASL. Why SASL? St. Andrews Static Languages. Has anyone used SASL or written SASL? Anybody? Okay. Well, I chose it because it is a sugared lambda calculus, so it's immutability and laziness. Um, Here's a quote. Um, what's interesting is that uh, David Turner was teaching a course in functional programming using Lisp. And I know uh, Lisp is often associated with the Lambda Calculus, but actually uh, they did not know about uh, Lambda Calculus and then created it. So when he was trying to teach it, it didn't work because the examples went wrong, the binding rules. It is now, but it wasn't then. And so then he used other other language named PAL, showed this to the students, and that was how he started creating SASL. Um, and so then, yeah, that SASL came from Lambda Calculus. I am, think I'm like a, am I like a slide behind what I'm looking at? There we go. So um, anyway, Lambda Calculus. Any calculus nerds in here? Anyone else love calculus? Awesome. Me too. So, um, oh, I'm like totally uh, behind a slide. I'm gonna look like this. Uh, so this is uh, Alonso Church is the person who is credited to creating Lambda Calculus. This is one of his early papers in the 30s. Uh, but what is interesting about this is that Again, that skipped Lisp. So the people that kind of found out about Lambda Calculus later was actually this guy, Richard Montag, who was working on languages, he was a mathematician. Um, and, but then what about functions? Where did functions come from? Uh, well, people will say Leibniz because that was in the 1600s, which is sort of true, which is true. That was the first term function. But the concept of a function actually has been traced back to Sharif al-Din al-Tusi, which is in the 12th, 12th century, the Islamic golden age. He's the first person we know of to create function as a concept, a function as a concept. So again, this just shows how things are not linear at all, right? So it, uh, you know, over here, back in the 12th century, he had this amazing concept, but no one knew about it, right? There's no message passing. So then went from Leibniz and then over to calculus, and that didn't make it to Lisp, and it all gets to Jose. So it's just a really, uh, I think, fun way to think about how a knowledge works and not kind of get stuck in this, um, you know, sequential trap. All right, back to functional programming. Uh, so pattern matching, obviously very important. Um, I'm gonna t uh, has anyone written NPL? Any NPL fans? Okay, uh, here is an example. John Darlington, um, uh, instead of using case statements, use multi-clause pattern matching, which is why I put this one in, because it's the functional part of pattern matching, which is really interesting and cool. I'm not sure how much time I have, I'm just gonna keep going. <laughs> um, so back to Erlang. Uh, Erlang was actually created by, uh, was first written in, I think everyone probably knows this, Prologue. Uh, who has written Prologue in this room? Fantastic, okay, so, um, written prolog first. Uh, there's a whole lot of cool things you can learn about this. Abstract synthesis tree, parser. Do yourself a favor and watch Quinn Wilton's talks on this. I don't know if Quinn's in here right now, but yes, uh, her talks are amazing. This is one of the great uh, uh, illustrations during it to go really in depth on telephony and all of the origins of Erlang that are really great. Um, also, Parlog. Has anyone written Parlog? Another cool language that Joe says was influential on um, Erlang, but I'm not gonna get too much into that. Uh, okay, back to Erlang. So, key to Erlang, uh, as we all know with Erlang VM, one of the keys is uh, it's not delicate, it's very fault tolerant, uh, which is why it's so useful for scalability. Uh, and let's see. Um, 
Sorry. Okay, so what does fault tolerance mean? It means if you're hurt and you ask someone to call a doctor, when they come back from the phone, you don't want them to say, I'm sorry, the doctor can't come to the phone right now. Why? Because the process is dead. Uh, uh, but that's okay, because in Erlang, the process restarts, it comes back from the dead, it does it all the time. Uh, so there's no downtime, let it crash. Um, it, you, but you want let it crash, <laughs> but uh, not the whole system. So Erlang has an answer for that. Uh, which is Plex, an Airy, not Erling, Erickson had an answer for that, which was Plex and Airy Pascal. Has anyone written Plex or Airy Pascal? Oh man, I really want to talk to someone about uh, So um, what's really interesting about these two languages is I found this quote from Joe um, that talks about them. So Erickson, uh, it says, has a, when he started working on Erling in the lab, there was already a culture around concurrent languages because they had developed um, you know, explicitly for programming telephone exchanges. First one was called Plex, for programming languages for exchanges. It had notion for concurrency, parallel processes, hardware protection, um, also Ari Pascal, and very exciting. And he says that, so all around my work there, there are people who had designed there, and they would say, well, a concurrent language has to have this in it. We have to have mechanism for code upgrade, because Axe had dynamic code upgrade. So you can change the program in Axe without stopping the exchange, which means that I guess Ericsson's been doing code upgrade for half a century. Um, so yeah, the next time someone says that uh, that's dangerous, um, has anyone done code upgrade in production? Well, I, yeah, so uh, anyway. Be fearless, use code to upgrade. <laughs> All right, so back to Elixir. Elixir is the Erlang VM plus other stuff. So what are some of the other stuff things that we love? Uh, so one thing is um, the pipe pipe ML. Has anyone written ML? Anybody? Couple ML? I think there's a ML talk, right? So the pipe pipe, pop pipe iterator, pipe operator is one thing that we love. From there, I'm gonna go through these kind of quickly. Who's written Python? There we go. We're getting a little more popular here. So obviously, uh, whenever we have you know documentation that becomes out of date, it's like torture, right? Because you it doesn't work the way it should. So uh, Python, you know, in 1999 they created doc tests, which of course were added to Elixir, which mean that now when you write your documentation, if it gets out of date, it will automatically break and make you fix your stuff. So thank you to Python for that. Um, then uh, another great thing that came over through Elixir is the Ruby community. So how many people in this room have written Ruby? Right, so, which is wonderful. Um, and so I talked, uh, Brian Hunter on my team said that Waterpark could have been built with the Erlang VM. It wouldn't have worked uh, in Java or Net. Uh, the reason they used Elixir is because of the missing stuff I was talking about. Um, it wasn't about syntax, but the Erlang, but it was, uh, the, Erl the syntax was fine, but the Erlang community didn't realize how off-putting their tools were, and the benefit of Elixir's syntax was that it drew in Ruby folk, so that when you were using Phoenix, it felt like Rails, um, and this also vibrant community of people who cared deeply about dev joy and productivity came over uh, with Ruby. And so, that is our tour through <laughs> 11 languages. Um, we have made it through Smalltalk, Elixir, SAS, uh, SASL, Erlang, ML, NPL, Prolog, Parlog, uh, Plex and uh, Ari Pascal, Python and Ruby. Um, thank you for coming, that was really fun. Um, just to try and remember, uh, again, there's this parallel processes of technological development um, across space and time. Uh, there's not only one way, there's not only one place to look. Uh, it's really interesting. I mean, you know, Prolog was created around the French language and, you know, uh, Erling was created uh, purely guided by, um, you know, 19th century telephone concepts. So you can really find design inspiration um, wherever you are. There's not one way. Explore the pluriverse of programming. Keep passing messages. And a huge thank you to Bruce Tate. Would not be up here without him. And Elixir Chat, if you know anyone who's interested in programming, tell them to go to Elixir Chat. Um, I was attending it like with one ear pod in with my like two week old baby on Zoom with my video off. And I'd be like, are you sure I can come? And Bruce is like, yes, we just want you there, however you can be there. Um, so thanks, Bruce. And um, yeah, thank you, Brian Hunter and Waterpark, because I love it there. 
And um, yeah, I've had the time of my life doing this talk for you. So thanks, guys. Thank you.